Hello. This presentation will look at how we can transition traditional literary artefacts to a new digital form. The presentation is in three parts. First, I look at why digitising the actual text is essential. Then I'll go on to show tools to do this for Swahili and Arabic script. And finally, I'll show how those tools can be used to digitise manuscript poetry. So, why do we need full digitisation? Well, the loss of cultural capital due to language displacement is now well recognised. But a similar loss is caused by script displacement. Using S1 and S2 by analogy with L1 and L2, we can say that when historical scripts, S1, are displaced by newer scripts, S2, either as a result of past colonial policies or more recent national policies enforcing orthographic change, a phenomenon of progressive S1 deliteracy may occur. This can be defined as a situation where modern-day speakers, especially younger ones, are increasingly unable to read documents that may encode significant amounts of cultural heritage. A wealth of traditional linguistic and cultural material, for example poetry, histories, religious tracts, may therefore become increasingly inaccessible to speakers of that language. Script displacement receives less attention than language displacement, perhaps because it is assumed that S1 cultural material can be conserved via digital scanning of the manuscript, or by creating a digital transcription into S2. But there are issues with both of these. Digital scans can't be searched unless they are transcribed. They're just so many pictures. It is easy to get the impression that these scans are considered of more value to librarians and archivists who consider them as objects, looking at their provenance or the type of ink used in them, than to scholars of history, language or literature, who are more interested in the content. Moreover, their large size means they are difficult to transfer, especially where internet access is limited, and they are difficult to handle, slow, on older machines. These problems can to some extent be resolved by converting S1 scans to PDF and enriching them with additional text layers, as Shatterberg and Samson did for Charles Sackler's 1939 Swahili Dictionary. However, selection on PDFs can be haphazard. It is also difficult to do any sort of computer-based analysis, for example, list all words occurring at the end of a line, unless you work solely on the text layer. And if that is the case, why not make the text layer a standalone digitisation? Another option is allowing annotations to be made on the image, but then this raises the question of how these should be stored and how they might be searched and compared. Where S1 has been maintained, another option is to provide an S1 digital version of the text alongside the S1 scan. Sometimes the scan is omitted in favour of a close diplomatic S1 transcription of the manuscript, or it is possible to move between the transcription and the manuscript. It's at this point that the text leaps, as it were, off the page and into the computer, out of the past and into the present and future. Close transcription, of course, requires the conventions used in the transfer from page to screen to be defined in detail. Where we have an S1 original and an S2 transcription, that is even more important. How much silent emendation of the text has been done? Have sections been omitted? How have ambiguous readings been handled? S2 transcription involves decisions that make the transcriber perforce an editor, whose decisions the reader must take on trust. In the case of Suhili, we have in the past ended up with what looks like an overly tidy text. As a thought experiment, consider whether any linguist, literary scholar or historian would seriously suggest studying Chinese, Greek, Arabic, Egyptian hieroglyphic texts solely via transliteration. However valuable, all these options, S1 scan alone, S1 scan plus S2 transcript, S2 transcript alone, tend to suggest that S1 belongs to the past and has little to contribute to the modern culture. Moreover, in effect, a judgment is being made on the value of the language, such that peripheral languages, minority languages either in terms of the number of speakers or the political heft of those speakers, get downgraded. We are saying that some languages do not deserve the resources available to others. 
In the past, scans were expensive and impractical. Transcription, with all its shortcomings and value judgments, was therefore seen as the only viable option, even if it was lossy when compared with the original manuscript. This is no longer the case. Scans or photos are now a more practical option, for example on handheld phones, and modern computers, especially the Unicode Glyph encoding standard, make it possible for almost any script to be represented. So there is a strong argument for producing true digitisations where possible, backed up by photographs of the manuscript. This cultural material can then transition fully to the modern digital world, instead of being viewed as an object in a museum collection. I'll move on now to looking at tools which allow us to do this. These have been developed for the Swahili language of East Africa, but the general principles can be applied to any language where script displacement is an issue. The tools are called andika, the Swahili word for write, which often occurs at the beginning of a poem as a command to the scribe to take up his pen and write down the words of the poem. First, I should say a few words on Swahili. Swahili is possibly the most widely spoken Bantu language in terms of both geographical area and number of speakers. It is widely used as L2 by some 90 million people in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda and the DRC, the dark green and light green areas here. But it is spoken as L1 by perhaps only 2 million people on the East African coast from Brava in Somalia all the way down to the Comoro Islands off the coast of Mozambique, the red areas here. Following Islamization, the S1 Arabic script was used quite widely for Swahili. A significant body of poetry and other writings survives from the late 1600s onwards. Under British colonial administration, Swahili was standardised in a Roman orthography, S2, from the 1930s on. That doesn't mean, however, that S1 has disappeared. Much S1 material exists in manuscripts, either originals or copies of originals, in Western libraries, and this is probably only a fraction of the extant total. Manuscripts are handed down through the generations as family heirlooms. More importantly, S1 is still used extensively in religious contexts, for example, mosque schools, and Ottenheimer in 2012 noted that Arabic script is widely used for Shinzwani, a Swahili dialect in the Comoro Islands, with a literacy rate of over 90%. I'll return to manuscripts in part 3 of this presentation, but before that, let's see how we can convert existing text in S2 Roman script into S1 Arabic script. The Andika website has an online converter which we can use. We go to Roman to Arabic and the Convert Text tab. Obviously, if you were converting a lot of text, you would use a locally installed version, but this will give you a flavour of the output. Let's take some text from Shule 2014, a paper in Swahili Forum about theatre for development. We select some S2 Roman text. We'll also paste it into a LibreOffice document for comparison later. Press the Convert button and the text gets converted to S1 Arabic text using the proposed standard spelling set out in Omar and Frankel 1997. We can then select that text and paste it into LibreOffice for further editing if desired. We need to set up a style for Arabic text. The website explains how to do that. Once we select the style, we get a nicer font and the text uses right to left direction. We can also round trip. We take the S1 Arabic text paste it into the Arabic to Roman converter and press the button. Let's paste the S2 standard Swahili output into LibreOffice to compare it with our earlier extract. They're almost identical, but some editing needs to be done to replace capitals, key Swahili here, because Arabic script has no concept of capital letters. This is why standardised spelling for S1 is important. It allows reliable round tripping. So, why are we trying to cater for Swahili in Arabic script? One of the reviewers for this paper seemed to think I was suggesting turning back the clock and advocating that Swahili be written in Arabic script for everyday use. Well, that's not going to happen. 
but the ability to use S1 may be useful in domains, for example, mosque schools, where that script is still used, or in places, for example, the Comoros, where S1 literacy is still high. Being able to create text in one script and convert to the other also provides an easy way of increasing the amount of modern S1 text available, for instance by converting S2 web pages or other documents to S1. It's easy to forget that, as the British Library's Endangered Archives programme says, Ajami, the modified Arabic scripts used in writing African languages, have been deeply embedded in the history and culture of many Islamised societies of Africa. Moomin 2014 notes that the use of Arabic script has been attested for at least 80 African languages. ISESCO, the Islamic Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation, has proposed a standard Arabic script that would cater for all African languages, but it seems doubtful that this will be effective because it tends to ignore local writing traditions. This is some sample text in Swahili with the ISESCO system at the top, replicated by Andika at the bottom. This shows that it's simple to replicate any spelling scheme provided the glyph is available in the font being used. The problem is that many Arabic fonts do not contain all the glyphs necessary to write Swahili. These are the missing sounds with the Andika glyph for them. The last three are for dialectal representation. Obviously other glyphs could be used if desired based on the writing tradition concerned. One option is to add missing glyphs to the font using a font editor, though this is problematic if there is not already a Unicode code point for that character. This is a step-by-step -step how-to that I wrote for this. A simpler option is to use a comprehensive font. Andika uses SIL's Scheherazade font, which contains a wide variety of glyphs, though not all of them as yet. Other possibilities are Khalid Hosni's Amiri font and the Pactype fonts. One important point is that since S1 Suhili is usually vocalised, it is best to avoid fonts which use Arabic legations extensively, since these can cause problems with placement of the vowel signs. Having selected the font, you then need a way to access the glyphs via the computer keyboard. The standard Arabic keyboard has a different layout from the standard English, US or UK keyboard. This is problematic because it means that you need to use different keyboards for each script. You also need to memorise different keys for the same sounds for each script. For example, T is on the top row under the left hand on an English keyboard, but T is in the middle row under the right hand on an Arabic keyboard. Andika opts instead to attach the Arabic glyphs to the key layout of the English keyboard. This means that typists can leverage what they already know from typing S2 standard Swahili. A big help here is the fact that Linux has a very flexible and versatile keyboard system, offering up to four glyphs on each key. First, you edit the relevant keyboard file, which is just a text file specifying the glyph or glyphs for each key. The glyphs are grouped as logically as possible using either sound or glyph likeness. For instance, Sukun is on the full stop key, Short vowels, long vowels and vowel carriers are all on the same key and related Arabic letters are mostly on the same keys as the English glyphs. For example, dal is on the D key, val is accessed using shift plus D and vad using alt plus D. Less common variants, for example alveolar dal as used in Mombasa, can be accessed using alt shift D. The result is that S1 Arabic Swahili can be typed as quickly and easily on an English keyboard as S2 Roman Swahili. So let's see how it works. I'm just going to type a simple sentence here in S2 Roman script, meaning I'm going home now. I can then do the exact same thing in S2 Arabic script using almost exactly the same keys. The only difference is that I type a capital letter to get the long vowel in the penultimate syllable, as suggested by Sheikh Yahya. As you can see, you can type at around the same speed in both scripts. Here's some text from a preface to a book of poetry in Chimini, originally spoken around Brava in Somalia. 
So Andika can certainly be easily used to create and edit new S1 digital text. But the main aim is to provide a way of handling S1 non-digital text, namely digitising S1 manuscripts, particularly those containing traditional poetry. In this last part of the talk, I will demonstrate how we can, in most cases, replicate the manuscript in digital form, much as we saw for the earlier transcriptions of medieval European material. Before I show you the process in detail, it might be best to show some examples of the output. Mona Kupona is one of the few female Swahili poets whose work has come down to us. In 1858 she wrote a poem containing advice for her daughter, and this is stanza 6 in two manuscript versions. Each manuscript line has been replicated digitally, and Andika also generates automatically a close transcription of the Arabic text. Apart from differences in spelling, the lower manuscript uses core Arabic letters, ayn and ha, and has a typo in the first word, where sukun and fatah should be reversed. This is part of a manuscript by Sheikh Yahya recording fishing songs in Kibajuni or Kitiku, a northern Swahili dialect. Note that here the automatic close transcription has been tweaked to stay as close as possible to standard Swahili orthography, while still representing the distinctive sounds of Kitiku. Saidi Abdallah wrote a lament in 1853 about the declining fortunes of the coastal city-state of Pate. These two stanzas describe the opulence of the palace in its better days. I'll show some more examples at the end, and there are others in the manual. But first, let's walk through typesetting a couple of stanzas from a Suhili Utenzi ballad. The process consists of four steps. Step one has to be done manually, in common with the scribes who originally created the manuscripts. We read the manuscript and type its text into LibreOffice, much as we just did for our own text. But instead of trying to follow a spelling standard, we type only what the scribe wrote in the manuscript. In step two, we tell Andika to parse the typed copy of the manuscript and import the lines of the poem into a database table. In the process, Andika automatically provides a standard or close S2 Roman transcription for the S1 Arabic text. Then, we tell Andika to read each line in that table and split it into words, which are imported into another database table. In step 3, we go back to manual work. We can scrutinise each word in the database and correct the automatic transcription if necessary. We can also annotate individual words with notes, alternate readings, transliterations, etc. This allows the development of a full critical apparatus for the text. And we can see here the various additions that were made to the full text of this ballad. In step 4, the computer will again do most of the work for us. It will output a digital transcription of the manuscript in PDF format, where there are various options for text layout, text colouring, line numbering, translation position, etc. See chapter 8.7 of the manual for further details. Here are the two stanzas with numbering and a note added, an English translation and a generated standard Swahili transcription. The generated close transcription in green is output right to left, so that it matches directly with the Arabic script above it. Here are a few more examples. Harris's 1967 edition of Umkunumbi is one of the few books of Swahili poetry to include the text in Arabic script. This digitisation shows a close transcription only, keyed to the half line rather than the full line. The Ballad Rasil Huli was written around 1850 by Mgeni bin Fakihi, and about 4,500 stanzas is the longest Swahili ballad in existence. Here, stanza 2280 has a close transcription keyed to the half line and a standard transcription keyed to the full line. Qasidas are panegyric poems in Arabic, eulogising the Prophet. Here, the Arabic original appears in blue and the Swahili translation is in green. This is text from Ahmed Parker's PhD on the Swahili Qasida poems. Here again the Arabic original is in blue, the Swahili translation in green and there's an English translation. 
Both have a close transcription, though the Arabic one is less than optimal at present. This is a recent poem by Ustad Mao from Lamu, who uses Arabic script for all his compositions. This one discusses the Swahili language. Andika also allows multiple copies of the same poem to be presented in parallel. See chapter 9 of the manual. This shows two versions of a ballad, each coloured differently so that they can be compared. Footnotes are marked in red. Andika is free GPL3 software, so you can use it and change it as necessary without having to pay anything. It has been developed and tested on Ubuntu Linux, but it is also possible to use it on Apple or Microsoft operating systems using software such as VirtualBox. Future development might involve providing a Docker image to simplify installation, implementing in-place editing of the database on a web page, as in another project of mine working with Chinese. So, to conclude, Andika goes a long way towards replicating S1 manuscripts as closely as possible in digital form, while offering numerous options towards providing a critical apparatus. There's no reason why the same approach could not be used or adapted for other languages such as Hausa or Fulani. Much effort has gone into digitising manuscripts by scans. I would propose enhancing this by paying local people to type in those manuscripts and others that may not yet have been digitised. This would generate local employment in the knowledge industry. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, I would have I have um, a question. Uh, I see you use a lot of um, harakat, short vowels, including some which uh, are not very common elsewhere. For example, uh, for the sound of a, you use um, uh, an alif. Um, uh, underline Aleph and uh, also notice that you uh, use um, both a Kaf and a Kehe. So in, in Persian, uh, normally one uses either the Kehe, which has you no know, um, small Kaf inside and uh, the Gaf. But in, in your case, you have both a normal calf and a kehe, which looks a bit like a swash calf. Uh, is this orthography actually used with the diacritics, or is this some ideal case uh, and uh, people in ordinary life will use a simplified version of it? Uh, you should activate your microphone. Okay. So yes, all the glyphs that are used are really based on Sheikh Yahya's own handwriting. And these are the sort of things that he used. Um, the system set out here isn't actually used officially anywhere, uh, but he was quite an important scholar on Swahili literature. So it's a good basis. However, as you'll have seen from some of those um, examples I gave, a lot of scribes don't actually follow a, fair, a consistent system. They may only use three vowels. They may use um, a dhamma with a tail instead of an inverted dhamma for an O sound and that sort of thing. So th- there's no really st- standardized form for Swahili and Arabic script yet. Hey, I have no other questions and I uh, want to, to thank you for your very nice talk and for this nice system you have developed. Okay, thank you.